February 19th again, 2017, Yalak here. And I'm looking some more at this ancient city of uh, Palmyra or Tadmor in Syria. We know ISIS is doing their thing over there right now. And all these things that are happening are about prophecy. Now, to share some more, I want to read something from this website at veteranstoday.com. And it's entitled, the article is entitled, The Destruction of Palmyra, the City of Deborah. Remember Prophet, Prophetess Deborah? It says here, Palmyra, which the Greeks called that, it was Tadmor, and I already read in the other video that Solomon had fortified the city. Palmyra could very well have evidence that Syria was once considered to be part of Israel itself. And I would think so, right? Because I've been thinking for a while now that we have been given too little information about the land area for Israel itself. It's, I mean, with time, more information just comes out, right? Because there's just uh, a lot of people out there that are just digging because a lot of things we're told in the world are just not adding up properly. They just don't make sense. So people are digging. Whether you read the Bible or not, people are just digging, digging, digging to find out what's really going on, right? what has happened on Earth. So they're saying this place, Palmyra, in Syria could well be part of Israel itself discussed in depth in Damascus, the Antichrist, and Armageddon, a critical analysis of Isaiah chapter 17 found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. The northern kingdom of Israel, before the Assyrian invasion, extended well into Syria and included Damascus. Which brings me to the subject of this article, Palmyra, its destruction by ISIS in 2015, and the CIA and Mossad, hand that has played out in the war in Syria and I said so long ago that as many people have noted a lot of these wars that have gone on over time in some of these critical areas in history are there in great part to destroy the history of the earth in those areas and to destroy any history that's tied to the biblical accounts of those places and the children of Israel that were in those places. And in some cases, the people in those places who may not have been of the children of Israel, but would help to shed some more light on the, the travels of Israel, where Israel went, the real extent of their domain, and their conquering, and their life, and the history of the Hebrew people. Because as the Hebrews travel around, they encountered other people. So if you're destroying the other people and relocating them to other areas, then you're, you're kind of hiding some of the history, right? Because you're moving those people who have the knowledge of that land, or that part of a land, putting them someplace else they have their children for generations later, who grow up to know something new from the new place they're living in. They're not that well connected anymore to where they were, where their grandparents were displaced from. In the Old Testament, when Joshua founded the nation of Israel as uh, federated democracy of 12 tribes when the highest authority authority was the judiciary one of the first judges was a woman called Deborah and we all know of Deborah we are told that she sat under a palm tree in the house of the most high Bethel meaning house of the most high right so yeah that that, that just actually rings a bell I mentioned a long time ago, and it's funny that they actually put it this way, you know, but my Hebrew teacher told me years ago that every word in the scriptures or in Torah and every letter actually is significant. It actually means something. It's there. And so word isn't just put in for no reason. And she was pointing out that about the story with Deborah, right? And judging under the palm tree and she was mentioning that there's a reason why it even said palm tree and now by even having the word palm in it we can understand some more here that this place is tied to the history of the children of the most high because she was on a palm tree so she was explaining that it didn't just say tree in particular so anyone can just think any kind of tree because you know, I mean, it's letting you know th that 
this was a specific kind of tree she was under and she wasn't just under any other tree um she was judging under this particular tree not just under hanging out under any other tree that the prostitutes might have been hanging out under waiting to pick up men so it's letting you know that deborah was there for a different reason than prostituting herself so the bible is written in in very it, it, it's 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 in terms that really sets itself apart right it's like a set apart book set apart set of writings right syria israel slash northern kingdom Ephraim, the firstborn of the Most High, Jeremiah 31, was invaded by the Assyrians, the Babylonian Iraqi Empire. As with many biblical texts which duplicate themselves in the various differing texts that have been put together into one book, the symbology of the palm is also found in the name Tamar, the wife of Judah. The city of Tadmor described as being built in Judea, reflecting the opposing political realities between the northern kingdom of Israel duplicated in the southern kingdom of Judah. Alright, here this part, it says the early Christians in Palestine were Hebrews who had the source material for Joshua and the foundation of the nation of Israel. The Yeshua sect. The covenant was the supreme covenant, no king but the God. The Yeshua sect became what is known as the Nazarenes, and the Essenes had taught what was later to become known as Christianity. So now, look at this. Look at this from gotquestions.org Because they're telling here, you know, what they're saying, from my understanding from this, is that the early Christians were Hebrews and they had the source material. In other words, they had the scrolls, the ancient scrolls of Israel. And they considered, they said there was no king but Elohim but the Most High of Israel. That means to me that they would not have seen Jesus as king. So people saying now he's king of kings, right? But look at what they're saying here, because they said um, they taught what was later to become known as Christianity. But we know that Christianity was built out of what the Hebrews taught. So if these Essenes were teaching from the scrolls and said the Most High Elohim was the only king. Then they weren't worshipping anyone else as king. But later on now, the Romans would have used what they were teaching from the scrolls and from the commandments to create Christianity. So when they said here, the early Christians were Hebrews, what it should your understanding should really come out being is that there is some kind of word play right there. Um, the, the, the Hebrews were not early Christians to flip it around in the sense that they had this Roman Christian belief. So there was a switch that happened somewhere on, right? Because these early Christians, they're telling you, who were Hebrews, did not consider anyone king but the Most High, meaning king over Israel. So when they say Jesus is king of kings, Lord of lords, or Yeshua is, you know. So let's look at some other places and see what we can find with this from gotquestions.org. Who were the Essenes? The Essenes were a Jewish mystical sect, or we could say a Hebrew mystical sect, somewhat resembling the Pharisees. We know a lot of other people had come in from the Edomites as well, from the nation of Edom, and were mixing in, right? Because there was no tribe of Pharisees. And there was just no group called the Pharisees in Moses' time and so on and in King David's time and so on. So you got to wonder where these Pharisees and Sadducees come up. Hint, hint, go look it up. They lived, and after that, this whole Jesus Christian thing picked up, right? They lived lives of ritual purity and separation. They originated about 100 B.C. and disappeared from history after the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70. The Essenes are not directly mentioned in Scripture, although some believe they may be referred to in Matthew 
19 verse 11 and 12 and in Colossians 2 verse 8, 18 and 23. Interest in the Essenes were renewed with the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls which were likely recorded and stored by the Essenes. Some scholars have said that John the Baptist was an Essene. Let me go down and look for what I want. The Essenes were in the desert. John and the Essenes used Isaiah 40 and verse 3 to describe themselves as the voice in the wilderness. The Essenes hid themselves away from society in the wilderness. Okay, look at this now. They're showing some differences between John and the Essenes because some people are saying John was a part of the Essenes, right? And uh, I'm not going to read all the differences they got here, but look at this one. John, like they mentioned the diet, saying that John um, had a stricter diet than the Essenes. But then they go on to say, John preached Jesus as the Messiah. And I'm reading this part here because the article I just read had said that the early Christians in Palestine were Hebrews. Because I'm trying to show a difference right between the Christians of the Roman Empire and the actual Hebrews who had their covenant who who did not worship Jesus as king or anybody as king because they said themselves that the Most High Elohim was the only king and they became known as the Yeshua sect so they're trying to tell us that this same um, Hebrews were, were the Christians but no there's a trick there somewhere either if that is the case as far as I've shown in many other videos um, and what I'm going to show here again then it would be the case that either the Christians were really Hebrews who, who Christians would mean early Hebrews who did not recognize Jesus as the Messiah did not but the name Christian was played upon and later rebranded so that you would think that Christians meant someone who believed in Jesus as the Messiah when originally it would have meant someone of the Essenes of the Yeshua sect who might have believed in Jesus but not as the Messiah meaning that he did not die for your sins so there could have been a switching in the interpretation of the word Christians because it's clearly letting you know that they the Essenes did not believe in Jesus as the Messiah even though they're trying to tell you in these writings and all these books and websites that the Essenes were the Christians or, or started what was Christ, um, the Christian movement. So there's a trick right there, right? So either that's the case, or the Essenes did not associate themselves with anything called Christian by worshipping Jesus as king, but they're just in later writings now telling you that the Essenes were part of this Christian movement, movement which was not actually correct, but they're bringing in the Essenes under the banner of Christianity to sell the Christian story of Jesus being the Messiah when the Essenes themselves are telling you they did not accept Jesus as Messiah this so it's, it goes on here from GodQuestions.org the Essenes did not recognize Jesus as Messiah but they taught that the teacher of righteousness would himself be an Essene and it, their document here ends up saying about the Essene that they deny they believe they're the only ones who possess the truth because they got the Essene churches today, such as one group such as the Essene Church of Christ. Um, but they deny biblical doctrines, including original sin, heaven, hell, and salvation through Christ. In salvation through Christ, because they didn't believe he was Messiah, and they lived right there. So how is it that people who lived around the time of Christ, and when the church was said to be starting up, are telling you that Jesus was clearly identified as a Messiah. When you got all these different groups that they don't talk about much in church history, you have to search and search and read some more to find some of these groups who were living at the time who resist Christ and, and strongly deny Christ and said they followed the Hebrew scriptures and they said he is not the Messiah. But then the Romans tricked it, right? And the popular teaching now that has survived for the better part of 2,000 years is that Jesus was the Messiah. But you got these other groups who followed Torah and they said, no, he is not. No, he is not the Messiah. And they denied it and they fought Rome strongly. And what you find out usually only in more reading and more studying is that these groups whose names are little mentioned, 
They resisted Rome so much and fought against this new Christian religion popping up that said Jesus was the Messiah. They resisted Rome so much that Rome fought them, killed them, burned them alive, and destroyed them, their cities and their groups and their movements. And got rid of them. So that what remains is people and groups that say Jesus is the Messiah. And they tricked the Hebrews and tricked the Gentiles alike. Because they were killed by these Romans from the Roman Empire. But one such group is still around today telling you, no way. He was not the Messiah and we still don't believe that today. Okay, you see, and that's why you have to do so much reading and studying, right? Because there's a lot of confusion because of the trickery that has gone on for 2,000 years. The first website I was reading from veterans.com is telling you that the early Christians in Palestine were Hebrews. So they're trying to make Christians and Hebrews as being synonymous, which has been the trick of the ages. But I've been saying, no, they were different people. The Hebrews were doing what they were commanded in the teachings of Moses and from what Abraham was carrying on with and so on, right? They were not Christians. Christians are a different group of people with a different belief, right? But these, um, they said these same Hebrews who were supposedly early Christians, they believed in the, co the supreme covenant. What could that be? The supreme covenant is not something that came out of Jesus' teachings or the apostles' teachings. Right? But would have been linked to the Sinai contract with Moses, right? And they did not accept anyone as king but the Most High. The Yeshua sect, they're trying to tell you then the Hebrews who were the early original Christians were a part of what's called the Yeshua sect and became known as the Nazarenes and the Essenes, right? Um, and out of their teachings, basically the teachings of the Nazarenes and the Essenes, which would basically mean the Hebrews were teaching these things that later became known as Christianity. Right? So they're saying the Nazarenes and the Essenes, their teachings later became known as Christianity. Well, why, why are they denying that even up until today? Because look at this now from this other website at the Nazarene Way. It's, this page starts off here saying, Essenism, talking about the Essenes, and Christianity are strikingly alike in their fundamental teachings. Right? And, and so, yeah, of course you can say that because we just read here that the early Christians were Hebrews and they, out of that, the teachings of the commandments came the Essenes. Because a lot of these different religions come out of the teachings of the Hebrews anyway. Right? So it's going to look similar. Look at the teachings of Christianity that talks about what the Hebrews did and Moses and so on. Why would they have Moses in it and different stuff like that and talking about King David and Father Abraham? Remember this song I used to sing as a child in Sunday school in Jamaica? Father Abraham had many sons, had many sons, had Father Abraham, and I am one of them, and so are you. So let's just praise the Lord, right hand, left hand, whatever, whatever it said. can't remember the rest. Um... We used to get to church so early as children, I think like 9 o'clock um, or 9.30 and Sunday school would start at 10 o'clock, something like that. And, you know, but anyway, those were some really young days right there. Um, but they're saying the Essene theology is much older than Christianity and contains nearly every essential doctrine and precept of the Christian religion. Didn't I tell you that earlier in this same recording? Although I mentioned it in other recordings in the New Testament is fake series. This other website, because I've told you a lot of confusion, by the way, different people have written things to confuse and to pull off the trickery. This first website is telling you that the early Christians in Palestine were Hebrews. So they're trying to let you know by that a quick reader would just stop and say, yeah, OK, well, Christianity is of the Hebrews and is what the Hebrews were doing. Right? And then it goes on telling you that this same Hebrew Christian movement became known in part as the Yeshua sect. And this Yeshua, so, so then Yeshua sect would be Christian and it would also be Hebrew. Then it also breaks down further to letting you know that the Yeshua sect became later known as the Nazarenes and the Essenes. 
So if you tie that all together, these are all synonymous. Christians, Hebrews, Yeshua sect, Nazarenes, Essenes. They're telling you that basically they're all one. Or, or one, which would be Hebrews gave birth to all the others eventually. So then Hebrews gave birth to Christian, which gave birth to Yeshua sect, which gave birth to Nazarene, and which gave birth to Essenes. So it's telling you that the root of all these things are Hebrew. In other words, they're trying to let you know that the Hebrews were into all these things, did all these things, and is the truth of all these things. Yet the Hebrews don't have any commandments that allow them to worship Jesus as Messiah or King. If that is the case, why are these same Hebrews who became the Christians, who became the Yeshua sect, who became the Nazarenes, who became the Essenes, not worshipping Christ as King? When the Essenes themselves are telling you, no, we don't regard him as King. There is only one King, the Elohim of Israel, who was not Jesus. Nobody called the king of Israel Jesus. David didn't look to Jesus for help. But this other website here is telling you from the Nazarenes themselves who who are who they're saying here on these other sources that the Nazarenes were the Hebrews who were the Christians, who were the Yeshua sect, who were the Nazarenes and the Essenes. But the, the Nazarenes here are telling you that the Essene and the Nazarenes and the the Essenes are telling you that the Essene theology is much older than Christianity. Let me say that again. Essene theology is much older than Christianity. So if it is much older than Christianity, that means something was going on with the Essenes that was not Christian. So if it was older than Christianity, then Christ wasn't there as yet in their doctrines, in their teachings, because Christ wasn't around, and so they would not have been teaching salvation through Jesus, and baptism in Jesus, and the right way to live through Jesus. Because the Essenes would have been living right, if they're dealing with the scrolls and the commandments. So how would they have been teaching rightness, to live right, through Jesus, salvation in Jesus when their teachings were pre-Jesus and pre-Christianity. See, it's a trick when you think of it, right? They're saying that it is often thought that the religion and morality taught and practiced by Jesus was without parallel or precursor and that his ideas were divinely inspired. So they're saying it was just, it was not around before the things that Jesus taught, that it was just new because he was divinely ex inspired by his so-called father. But now they go on, these Nazarenes here are telling you themselves that these teachings of Jesus in the New Testament are not unique, right? They are not unique, however, when compared with Essenism, right? The Essenes existed as far back as BC 150 in the days of Jonathan Maccabeus, thus predating Christianity and Jesus Christ by nearly 200 years. And I've told you already that there were Christian churches, or just churches I might say, from what I found, 200 or so years before Jesus was even born and before the day of Pentecost and before the so-called Church of Christ. So then it could mean that there is a play on the word Christian, something we don't fully understand about the word Christian. Because it's telling you that people, with enough reading, that people who were keeping the commandments only and did not worship Jesus and get their salvation from Jesus were commandment followers or commandment keepers. And identified themselves then as Christians. But because Christian was not around before that, because somewhere in the New Testament, I don't know where to find it now, I don't know if it's Acts chapter 4, it's telling you, okay, let me let me try to find it here. In Acts chapter 11, verse 26, hear what it says. And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass... Okay, look at this as well. Antioch means driven against. Capital of Syria. See, the same kind of 
place we're talking about now as I made the other video and I was dealing with Palmyra all right so we're talking about all the same area so they brought him unto Antioch and it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people and the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch and when you click on that it says Christian means a follower of Christ Christianos from the Greek it means a follower of Christ now how could the Essenes having their church who they're telling you call themselves Christians and as I've pointed out that I've learned that these Christian churches were there from 150 to 250 BC or before Christ in African places African lands so there seems to be a trick with the word Christian where maybe after some kind of wars and uh, conquest the term that they used was was erased so the, there was a rebranding and they called themselves Christians they called these churches Christians so let's say um, people were in Africa of the Hebrews who had churches what if they'd called for example I'm just guessing this now what if they'd call themselves camps the way we call ourselves camps today Hebrew camps but after the Romans took over and fought these many wars and conquered them got rid of the term camp and just said Christ and said church or Christian church then what you would have heard was that there was all these Christian churches in these African lands that the Romans conquered when in reality they conquered and took over and took down the Hebrew camps see what I'm trying to say because if a Christian from the Greek Christianos means a follower of Christ how were people following Christ 150 years before Christ 150 years before 0 AD that the Essene, like the Essenes did how can the Essenes and the Nazarenes follow Christ 150 years before Christ was born can you follow somebody who was not yet born okay Donald Trump just became president and everybody's wondering what's gonna happen now with the world just like they wonder what's gonna happen with Obama everybody you're wondering what's gonna happen next oh this one's gonna bring in World War III and tear down you know but can anyone follow the directives of President Trump's President Trump's in the United States directions like 70 80 years ago could someone have done that no because he was not yet there as president 90 years ago 100 years ago no he wasn't president he wasn't even born so how can the Essenes follow Christ when Christ was not around and did not teach anything 150 years before so you see what I said in the first article veteran veterans way.org or whatever I call the website you see what I said there is a trick with how veterans today.com with how the information has been passed on to us it has come about in confusing manners right because uh, back then people were writing confusing things to pull off the trickery but it's being unraveled today the Essenes could not have followed Christ initially because Christ was not yet born and taught nothing with his non-existence because he never walked and taught anything that the Essenes could have followed since he did not exist when they started up and had their teachings running so long before he even talked anything and walked on the earth so if the Essenes or telling you that they are commandment keepers and they did not worship Jesus as King and Messiah that means that somebody is lying to us all when they tell us that the Hebrews were the Christians no the Hebrews were not the Christians and that the Hebrews were the Christians who became the Nazarenes and the Essenes how can the Hebrews become the Christians and then the the Essenes and so on believing in Jesus when the Essenes who were the Christians who were the Hebrews are telling you that they did not worship Jesus as King and did not even see him as Messiah because the commandment says thou shalt have no other power before me Deuteronomy 5 verse 7 the Most High in Deuteronomy 5 verse 6 first identifies himself by saying I am the power that brought you up out of the land of Mitzrayim I am that power in other words you worship me you worship the power who brought you out you worship the one who delivered you you worship the one who broke you out of that bondage 
So he identifies himself as the one who did that for them. So he now becomes their identifiable power, their associated power. So they associate power and deliverance and salvation from their enemies, as in this case, Egypt. They, as they associate power with the Most High, not with Jesus, or if he had a son, which he didn't, that came from heaven. They would associate themselves with him, the Father, and not a son that somebody said he had. He said, you worship me. So even if the father had this so-called son, Jesus, living up in heaven, he was telling them in Deuteronomy 5 verse 6, associate yourself with the father and not with his son. I am the power that brought you up out of the land of Mizraim. So after identifying himself as the one to be worshipped as that power that brings their deliverance and salvation, and who should be their Elohim, then after identifying himself as that one to be worshipped, then he goes on in verse 7 now of the same Deuteronomy chapter 5 to say, Thou shalt have no other power before me. So verse 6 in Deuteronomy chapter 5 identifies the Most High, has the Most High identify himself as the only worshipful Elohim in Israel. And then he goes on in verse 7 to specify that no other Elohim should become a worshipful one to you. So no other deity, no other name, no other power, no other being should be thought of in your mind as being worshipped. So even if that deity is his son, you should not because I. So when Jesus says now I and my father are one, you know it's a trick because it cannot come out of the mouth of the lesser deity or of the offspring of the greater deity to convince you that he and the father are one. But the father should be identifying himself as being one with the lesser deity. So Jesus is telling you, I and my father are one. But is the most high, the, the father, identifying himself in that way and telling you, I and my son are one, my son and I are one? No, only the so-called son is claiming that, but the father needs to claim that. And it needs to be done, not going through a lot of tricks with, with finding out 15 Hebrew words and 25 scriptures to show it. Why is there no clarity when the Mosai says through Isaiah, I declare things plainly and clearly? Not declaring such a thing between Jesus and himself being one, the way Jesus can declare it clearly and plainly, so that you don't need no Greek to figure out what he's saying when he says, I and my father are one. Well, where are the scriptures that clearly say, quickly, that you don't even need the Hebrew, that the Mosai is saying, I and my son are one? All right, so there's a trick right there, right? Because I just showed you that... The, the the Essenes, we are told, were a part of the Christian movement and started the Christian movement because they were the Christians who were the Hebrews. But I also showed that that's a misunderstanding and wrong teaching over time because the Essenes clearly said they do not worship this Jesus as king, which is what Christianity taught. So that would mean then that if the Hebrews are Christians who are Nazarenes, then the Hebrews are Nazarenes. And if the Hebrews are Christians who are Nazarenes, who are Essenes, then it means that the Hebrews are Essenes. And if the Hebrews are Christians who taught the Christian doctrine, then the Christian teachings teach that Jesus is King and Messiah. But then if also the Hebrews are Essenes, and the Essenes teach he is not the King, he is not the Messiah, and the Elohim of Israel is the only King, then you have a, a serious mental and theological problem as well where just even in your mind you would struggle to make both statements be true that the hebrews are christians who taught the christian belief that jesus is king and messiah when on the other hand the same hebrews who are christians who are essenes tell you he is not king he is not messiah let me move on so back to this website at the nazarene way Look at this interesting stuff. The differences have arisen after the death of Christ. Throughout its history, the Christian religion, uh, see, and that could just be a part of what some people say, whereas I don't believe Jesus even existed, but some who teach against Jesus as Messiah 
they believe, so they believe basically the same thing I believe, those teachers, that he should not be treated as the Messiah. But it's just that they believe that he was a real person, whereas I think he was not a real person. But at least, you know, um, as far as the teaching that he's Messiah, them and myself would believe the same thing. But, but, but here what they're saying here now is that throughout history, um, the Christian religion has frequently changed its doctrines. So what that's telling you then is that even for those who say he was a real person, he was our big brother and he, he was a great teacher and so on, but he was just not the Messiah. What, what it's really showing then is that he would have lived then and they would then be correct where I would be wrong on the point that says he did not even exist. They then would then be correct who say that he was a real person. He was just not the Messiah, just not the Messiah. They would be correct in that. But then history would be going on to say that after he died, people made him into the Messiah. Right? After he died, and that's the trick that you have to find. So, so myself, who believes he was not a real person, and those who still teach against him, um, who believe he was a real person, we might go in and out of agreement on some of these other minor points, but we still come back together in the end to say, no, he's not the Messiah. Because for me, it's not that big of a deal if someone says he really lived, because I don't fight that strongly, because I don't know, I just have an inkling from different things I read that he didn't exist, and one day I will do a lesson on that, to show why, right? But it's, it's I don't crux any great thing on that, because it doesn't really take away from me showing that, you know, we shouldn't really trust him for salvation. But they're telling you here that after, throughout history, the Christian religion has frequently changed its doctrines to suit the particular needs and circumstances of the times. So, so, whereas the Hebrews would stay with their teachings, right, and were commanded to not forget the book of the law and so on, whenever they went into captivity, they would come back to it. Right? They would come back to it and start to do it right again. But Christianity teaches Let's get another scripture on that. All right, look here in Second Kings chapter 23 and verse 1 and 2. And the king sent and they gathered unto him all the elders of Judah and of Jerusalem. And the king went up into the house of the Most High and all the men of Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem with him and the priests and the prophets and all the people, both small and great, and he read in their ears all the words of the book of the covenant which was found in the house of the Most High. So we see after all this time, they're still coming together and reading what was in the book. Verse 3, um, partway through that it says, the words to perform with all their soul, all their heart, all their soul, to perform the words of this covenant that were written in this book. But they're telling you that Christianity is changing its teachings and its doctrines over time. So no matter what the children of Israel went through, the nation was always, when they repented, they're always coming back and going back to what was written in the book of the law in order to keep things the same. They were trying to return all the time. So yeah, they might have gone astray, but they kept trying to return, return, return. And here now in verse 24, Moreover, the workers with familiar spirits and the wizards and the images and the idols and all the abominations that were spied in the land of Judah and in Jerusalem, the Josiah put away, because see, they went astray, right? But he put them away, that he might perform the words of the law, which were written in the book that Hilkiah the priest found in the house of the Most High, because they'd lost the book and they found it, so they start to, to bring themselves back to it, right? So, I mean, we have to see that the Hebrews were doing something different. They were trying to stay in, on course, but when they went astray, they brought themselves back. But they're telling you here from the Nazarene way that Christianity changed its teachings, its doctrines, um, over the course of time. All right, look at this interesting thing again from the Nazarene way website that I'm reading from. The, it has already been pointed out that there were so-called Christian churches long before Jesus and long before the church in the book of Acts. 
150 to 250 years before all of that happened. And that the Essenes, who were somehow supposedly called Christians, right? so it would seem that they were called Christians later on because they could not have been called Christians 150 to 200 years before Christ. But I read to you already that the, the followers of Christ were first called Christians at Antioch in New Testament times after Jesus had died. After he had died. But certainly 150 BC and 200 BC and so on, he did not die yet, so they weren't called Christians. So anytime you find Christian prior to that time, before 0 AD, before Jesus was even born, you know somebody went back and wrote the word Christian in it because of misunderstanding or an effort to mislead. So now, these Essenes who had churches and the Nazarenes who were um, inc incorrectly called Christians, who were the actual Hebrews, they're telling you that they had something like camps that we have today. But the Hebrews with camps today are not Christians. They look somehow similar because they're using the Bible and they talk about God, but we don't call him God, right? Although a lot of us like myself still need to get out of the use of that word so much. But they might have different things like, um, like I said, they're still going to use the Bible and so on, you know, but they're not Christians. So they use the word camps to kind of link back to the tribes of Israel and also to show some difference, but they are not Christians. Right? meaning part of the Christian religion. And so they are different. Yet these people who were incorrectly called Christians, who were of the Essenes, a couple hundred years before Christ was even born, they had in their churches, so that means churches were in operation before the day of Pentecost, but yet we are told that the church was born on the day of Pentecost, after Jesus died and the Holy Ghost came. So you see what I'm trying to tell you? When Paul is saying the church in the wilderness, it's all a gimmick. They weren't having no church in the wilderness. It was called church in the New Testament. But it was just a group of people from the nation of Israel who were wandering, passing through um, the wilderness. They weren't having church. They were walking through the wilderness, leaving bondage. So they had in their churches bishops, elders, deacons, and priests. How can you say that bishops, deacons, elders, and priests means you are Christian? When you got Hebrew camps today who use some of these terms as well, and they are not Christian. So I'm trying to tell you that the Hebrews then would have run something that we are being told is a Christian church, but was not a Christian church in the regular sense. But because they had something that would more be called a camp that we would call a camp today then the writers came on now messing with history tried to spin that and say it was a christian church just because they were overcome and dispersed they let you know this was a christian church but then you can't add it together because how could they be a christian church when the christians were first so called at antioch after jesus died no it was the hebrews that had their gatherings that you might call camps today, that was probably somehow called a church, called a gathering, they were the ones who had these gatherings 200 years before Christ, who were called the Essenes. So the, the terms bishops, elders, deacons, priests were in use before Christianity and before Jesus even touched down on earth, before he pushed out of Mary's womb for those who say he lived. So there's a lot of trickery going on that you have to think through and read through, right? There's something I'm looking for on their website here before I close this up. Uh, I can't seem to find it. Maybe they don't have it here. All right, look at this. One of the things they say here is that the Essenes in their so-called churches, that they're calling them churches, but in their movement or group, way before Christ even lived and did miracles, they performed many wonderful miracles. And many texts 
teach us that Christ and his apostles did the same. So people were miracle workers before Christ even came, but the New Testament makes it a big to do like only Jesus was doing miracles. But as you study and learn and increase your knowledge more, you realize that miracles were nothing unique to Jesus and his story. Nothing unique. It was going on. So how did, if, if, if Jesus is working miracles because he is the Son of God and he is actually God himself, and I just heard again a couple more passages just this last week or two, see Jesus is God. And they're very popular. I could mention their names. I don't want to do it right now. I'll do it some other time because I'm going to make a video about that. All right? But they're saying Jesus is God. And so we were taught as children growing up that the reason he was able to work these miracles is because he was God and the Son of God and um, the Messiah and all the other different terms. But people who were not God, people who were not, um, who were not, the Son of God, people who were not the Messiah, who were just Hebrews in a sect called the, the Essenes, why were they working miracles? But the New Testament doesn't big up on that, right? Because they have to sell Jesus as being unique by showing him as working all the miracles that other people weren't working. They performed cures as signs and proof of their faith. Again, uh, um, Christ's disciples were to cast out devils, heal the sick, and raise the dead, and so on. Mark 16, verse 17. So it's showing you that they were doing all these things right, even before Christ came. They had the ability to heal physically, but especially spiritually, and raise the dead but you thought Jesus was the only one, right? So these Hebrews who became, who who were who started this movement of the Essenes or these Torah keepers who did not worship Jesus as Messiah or King, where did they get their power from to raise the dead? But you didn't hear about that in the New Testament, right? So they were doing these things, healing the sick and raising the dead, as well as healing people spiritually by teaching them proper Torah things and so on to heal up their inner life and so on, to turn to their creator. They were doing all these things before Jesus even came and raising the dead. And they were saving the lost sheep of Jewish people, but that means the lost sheep of the house of Israel, right? From eternal death outside the Most High's kingdom by having them return to Torah teachings, which means that these Essenes were the Hebrews. But it seems at some point they were infiltrated and later scattered and so on, right? Because I got a teaching where I want to show some stuff that happened um, with that. And they said even Paul was among the Essenes for probably a year or two. Um, but it seems that there was some stuff that happened later on that kind of messed up the Essenes that the Romans did infiltrate them and so on. But at least we know how they started out, right? They're saying here, the... Clearly, Essenism and Christianity are strikingly alike in their essential features. I mentioned some of the stuff. Um, I didn't mention the rest of the things that they showed that were like Christianity. So what it seems here is like Christianity was made out of a lot of the teachings and practices of the Essenes. Because it said that they even broke bread regularly, which is a term that you find in the New Testament with Christ and his disciples. So they're were, they were mirroring what the Hebrews were doing to start up their Christianity. No wonder they can say that the, the early Christians were Hebrews. But they weren't, early Christians weren't Hebrews in the sense that they were a part of the Christianity that is here today or that the Roman Empire was dealing with, was setting up. They were Christians in that sense. There were Torah keepers whose practices and rituals and lifestyle and teachings were mirrored and mimicked to create the Christian religion. So once a Christian religion is created, when you see a Christian and an Essene who was a Hebrew Torah keeper walking down the street and walking downtown and doing this and that, you watch them for a week or two, they both look the same. So when you get down to write history now, or when you look back in pictures and whatever, and the stories of their life, now today you're reading it 2,000 years later, you said, yeah, yeah, they were all Christians. No, one was a Christian who mimicked his, his, the setup of his religion from what the Essene Hebrew Torah keeper was doing. 
And so the Christian was made to live a life that looked very close to the Hebrews so that they can blend and merge. And so you now call all of them Christians. But it's a trick. But the former system, the Essene system, or Essenism, contains nearly every important doctrine and precept of the Christian religion because the Christian religion was made out of it and then they just call the Essene movement in general Christian because they would later fight off the Essenes and that's what they did. Just like with um, the other religions that they took over that they did and then they even churches in Africa the Romans took them over some of them they just killed and fought outright some of them they bought out with gold with money right and just slapped the term Christian on them but they were running African churches that did not worship this particular Romanized Christian Jesus neither Josephus living in Judea nor Philo in Alexandria speak of Christianity why you know yet both describe a remarkably similar religion in doctrines and moral precepts which they call the Essenes so that's what I'm telling you if these guys didn't know of Christianity it's because slowly over time Christianity was being formed and then they slapped the name on it until everybody that they took over were Christians So they ended here saying, we are driven to the conclusion that Christianity was derived from Essenism. In other words, they're telling you that Christianity was derived from what the Hebrews were doing, who were known as the Essenes. Then later on now, it is understood that Christianity made out of the Essenes of the Hebrew Torah keepers grew among Gentiles while Hebrew Christians if we may call them that remained Essenes I told you that already I told you in many videos in my New Testament is fake series that the Hebrews were slaughtered because they wanted to remain Hebrews in every sense they did not want the Christian Jesus doctrine that you should worship Jesus as Messiah because I've pointed out that the Essene people here today are telling you that they did not regard Jesus as Messiah and that's why they were slaughtered and ran into parts of Africa because once the Roman Empire brought their Christian religion up to that point where it was ready to really take off they had to get rid of the resistors who were the Hebrews who were also the Essenes they got rid of them they chased them they killed them and a recent video I made showed that they the Romans even gave time for the Roman Christian who are the Gentiles, who believed and worshipped Jesus, they were given time as Christians to take themselves to safety out of the city. And once the Christians got to safety and were out of the way, then they started to attack and slaughter the Hebrews. And many of them were killed, probably over a million, they said, and others of them who survived fled and ran into parts of Africa. That's where, that's what happened. And even that last battle at Masada, I read one place that some of those, uh, not all of them died. The ones that were left died at Masada, right? Kill themselves. They'd rather kill themselves than give up. But some of those at Masada, Jericho, who left earlier, before they were completely cornered, left and came over to parts of the Americas, even as far as to North America. They see we scattered, we ran all over the place. Look at this now. And I thought I would have closed this already, but, uh, and this started out being some other kind of recording, it, it coming to this because it's hard to resist this kind of information. The Essenes, um, okay, let me pick up part way through this chapter, through this paragraph. Around 100, AD the name Christian 
the name Christianity, the new name Christianity, which had been coined a few decades earlier because I read to you that they were first called Christians in Antioch, right? Um, um, so the name, the new name Christianity. I, ah, gee, look at that. I told you earlier that when they said the, the Essenes were having Christian churches, it was just a trick with the word Christian. It would not have been Christian churches. It might have just been churches or just camps that they were running or gatherings because if the Essenes were up and running and gathering as a people 150 to 200 years before Christ was even born and before anybody was called a Christian, that means they would not have been using the word Christian because Christian was not being used as a word at that time 200 years before Christ and before the church launched on the day of Pentecost. But around 100 AD, the new name after Christianity was set up by the Roman Empire, the new name Christianity, which had been coined a few decades earlier. So when they read to you, just like I read from that first website and in other books that you find, that uh, the um, Christianity, this is what they were doing. No, the term wasn't coined yet. So the, the, the churches in Africa would have been called something like camps. But the new name Christianity, coined a few decades earlier, became... Uh, came into widespread use to distinguish Gentile Essenes from, excuse me, from Hebrew Essenes. So listen to this now. How can such a, a name pick up if the Roman Empire wasn't doing it? It was a government push to spread this religion and spread this name. That's why it picked up like that, right? To spread this term of Christianity, this name, because they were making a new religion. Notice that for 200 or 250 years, the Essenes, 150 years, the Essenes who were Hebrews keeping Torah, they didn't blow up that big. Why? Because it was just among the Hebrews, Torah keepers. And all the other Gentiles that were in the Roman Empire didn't want their stuff. So they didn't blow up that big. So now when the Romans set up the Christian religion, because the Hebrews resisted this Jesus Christ as being king and Messiah, and they were fought against and so on, then once the Romans set up their religion by mimicking what the Essenes were doing, the Essenes identified that as being something very different because they're teaching that we should worship Jesus and so on and believe him as the Messiah. But the Essenes, who were the Hebrews, said, no, we don't believe that stuff. So they remain separate to the point where they're telling you now that there were Gentile Essenes and there were Hebrew Essenes. If I can put it in our vernacular, it's kind of like saying that at that time there were, there were Gentile um, readers of the, the, the scriptures and there were Hebrew readers of the scriptures but both were practicing it and believing it differently you see that? that's the trick but because they're both using the same Bible to put it in our term today or the same scrolls it seems so similar that eventually the conquerors who won in history wrote it a different way to let you think that the Hebrew Torah keepers were the Christians of the Roman Empire utter garbage utter they considered themselves different because their torah elohim told them thou shalt not have any other power before me so they're not going to look at an elohim called jesus and worship him as king and as the most high giving him the same kind of worship no way and they go on saying we still even though they were different the two groups the gentiles and the hebrews so now, so, oh, wait a sec. So what that's telling you is that Gentile Essenes and Hebrew Essenes. So before that, when you read history, there was only Hebrew Essenes. All of a sudden, when the Roman Empire is sitting in Christianity, now a new, new group of people come up called the Gentile Essenes. They were the actual Christians. But initially, they were called Gentile Essenes. Right? And we still find Christians desperately... Denying the obvious. The Essenes did not believe in the resurrection of the physical body, but believed in a spiritual resurrection. So hold up now. If the 
Hebrew Essenes did not believe, if the Essenes did not believe in the resurrection of the physical body, then that's telling you that these two groups were really two different groups. The Gentile Essenes and the Hebrew Essenes, who actually was the group that came before the Hebrew Essenes. But because the Hebrew Essenes did not believe in the resurrection of the physical body, it's telling you they did not believe Jesus slash the Messiah of Calvary was the actual Elohim to worship and was the son of God in that sense. Right? That's what they're telling you. Because if they did not believe in the resurrection of the physical body, they're telling you he was no Messiah to us, the Hebrews. Because if they don't believe in the resurrection of the physical body and they were living then, do you tell me the people who were living then said they were witnesses that he resurrected. They know he resurrected. But you still have people who were living then who were the Essenes who told you, no, he didn't resurrect because such things aren't true. Yet you gravitate to the ones who say he did resurrect because they lived at then and they are witnesses. But you got other people who lived at then and said, no, no such phenomenon happened. We were living at the time. And we are Hebrews who are truthful and we keep Torah at the same time when Gentile Essenes form themselves as an Essene movement, a Gentile movement, who didn't keep Torah the way we do. But of course they were learning some of it. Who would you more trust? The ones who remained as Torah keepers, who were actual Hebrews, or the Gentile Essenes who were making up a religion who didn't follow Torah? Can you imagine how striking it would have been for a Hebrew to be living at that time? And you go to your Hebrew camp, and uh, you're living there a couple hundred years before Christ. And all of a sudden you hear this big wave of this Jesus Christ that come at 0 AD, is born in 33 AD, he died and went up into heaven and so on. That they say. So you are a he in a Hebrew camp. And you pick up your children, you go to Shabbat meeting or whatever. And, uh, you know, and all of a sudden you've been living all along with Torah and you don't believe in a no resurrection of a Hebrew savior. And you worship only the Most High because you are a Hebrew Essene. And one day you just get up and you walk down the street and you hear people talking saying, Jesus, he resurrected and he is now your Messiah, Hebrews. And he resurrected. You look in your scriptures and you're like, no, we teach this stuff isn't real, isn't true. At that time, you are living, not now, but you're living at that time. Let's say you're living in 33 AD and you hear that on your way to Shabbat meeting. Are you going to just start believing that? No, it would be so shocking to you that you'd pull yourself away more from that and you'd be teaching against it. It's now today that they get us to believe that because they, the trickery has been well put together, but it's being unraveled. So the these Hebrew Essenes did not believe in the resurrection of the physical body, but believed in a spiritual resurrection. And please understand me, these Essenes, they have their own set of scrolls. They were such a go-to people for Torah and for the scriptures that John the Baptist even was among them. It is said that Paul learned from among them and that the Romans wanted to get in on their act. So they were the go-to people for Torah in their times. They were healing people so people would have been coming to them for physical healing. So these guys are deep with the Hebrew text, deep with the Hebrew scrolls, deep with the scriptures. And you're telling me a resurrection happens right under their noses and they don't know or have any way to prove and to verify that it is real that it happened? How can the people who are the go-to people for healing and miracles and even raising the dead not be rushed upon by the Romans and by the Gentile Essenes and by everybody to say, hey, look at this, this Jesus resurrected. The Jesus that you teach, even though you don't teach he is the Savior, and the Messiah, he just resurrected. Come, you don't think they would have run over there to verify when the same New Testament says you should prove all things and try all spirits? The Hebrews are told, don't believe in any other power. Don't trust in them. The commandment says that Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 7, don't have any other power. But the Hebrews are looking for a Messiah and they hear the story that their Messiah that they didn't believe in just resurrected right before everybody's eyes, so to speak. Not literally before the eyes, but I mean in their mind because it's big news hitting the airwaves everywhere over the towns surrounding Jerusalem. And these Hebrews looking for their Messiah don't rush over there 
in Jerusalem to find out the facts of this and to say, ah, he is our Messiah. Instead, all the information caused them to not change their belief that there was no physical bodily resurrection, did not cause them to drop their teaching that said this Jesus is not the Messiah and he's not the Son of God. It did not cause them to. Remember, that every time the Hebrews had something happen, they would check history that they were looking forward to, like even Cyrus coming, to see if the person coming now is the one prophesied in Scripture. So Jesus resurrects right before everybody in Jerusalem and the Essenes who are the experts at the scrolls who everybody is flocking to for even physical bodily healings and resurrecting the dead, they will not run to come and verify their scriptural prophecies by going to find the Messiah, who was clearly meeting with the disciples. They don't go and try to find him to see, you really resurrected and let me see those holes in your hands from the cross nails. Think people, come on, think. Look at this. Some modern Christians assert that the Essenes not only omitted to teach these doctrines, that would be the Hebrew Essenes, they didn't teach these, some of these doctrines like incarnation and different Christian faith principles and so on. Um, they didn't teach these doctrines, but that on the other hand, these Hebrew Essenes or Hebrew Israelites that kept Torah, they taught other doctrines not taught in Christian New Testament. Why? Because they were teaching the doctrines of the Most High that he said my doctrine would drop as rain. They were teaching the doctrines or the teachings of Torah. Torah or law means teachings. They were teaching the law of the Most High. They were teaching what dropped at Sinai. That's what they were teaching. Are you getting it now? And then they go on to say this is not unlikely. In other words, this would most likely have been the way it happened. From all that they gathered in history, they can tell you this is really the way it would have happened, most likely. But the, so, so if they were teaching the same Torah stuff from Sinai and all that, they kept true to the teachings. Because I showed you, even when Josiah found the book of the law, they read it again from Deuteronomy. And they said, oh, we have, when Shaphan, I think it was Shaphan, the scribe, found the book of the law and uh, took it to Hilkiah, the priest. They said, oh, we went astray. So they read it. Now they were still following the law, but not as properly and they're like no we want it properly so they went back and they 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 corrected things right so they were always trying to keep that straight line but yet the christian religion frequently changed its doctrines to fit the circumstances throughout its history the name of the essenes had been changed pre previously from hasidim to essenes um, so, so again, you see, this whole, a lot of the names are being changed, 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 changed. It, it's very, 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 it, it's a lot of trickery, right? That's why I'm saying even this word Christian, since they weren't called Christians until a certain time, how could they have been called Christians from pre-Jesus times? It's because somebody went back and slapped the name Christian on it, but they were Hebrews doing their thing, right? Okay, a lot of information on this side. i got to get off of this now. But... Yeah, so and, uh, it really it started talking about, um, but they got into all this New Testament stuff, about the destruction of Palmyra, the city of Deborah. All right. um, so it's telling you that this Hebrew prophetess, this woman Deborah, she was in this very area, right? And it's just showing again that the scriptures are really true because these are the places where the Hebrews were at, right? And it's written in the Hebrew scriptures and we're finding that these things are taking, they're waking up in the news again in these last days. They were just sitting there dormant and now all of a sudden you start hearing all these places being hit by conquest, war, bombings and takeover and relocation of its people. It's happening more and more now in these last days, right? Because it's shown that the scriptures are true and while people are finding out more and more, they're trying to hide all these things by doing all this destruction in these different places.